We're actually here with the juggernaut. That's right. The juggernaut. We seen your guys' videos and I was like, why don't we like build a little team of our own? Hey, what's up guys? We're over here with the Gravel Kings. We got Ronnie. And uh, our boy Roy is here, and he has a special, special, special part in today's episode. Um, we're actually here with the Juggernaut. That's right, the Juggernaut. We were pumped to freaking feature this thing. As you guys know, this truck is legendary to the scene. Legendary of swallowing up whoops, swallowing up some trophy trucks too, huh? Yeah. Following up a lot of things, just crushing, man. This truck just eats. Um, but before we do that, man, we actually want to talk to our boy Ronnie about the Gravel Kings. Talk to these guys and kind of see what they're all about. Introduce them to the scene. What is Gravel Kings for, for, for the people out so, there wondering? Gravel Kings is a group of buddies that went out to Dumont one day. We rented some Can-Ams. Yeah. Totally destroyed them. Oh, crap. So we're glad they're rentals. Actually, I own that car now. So you, you had and to I, buy it. I had to buy it. Yeah, yeah. So we, I ended up buying it. Um, but we went out to Dumont, we had a lot of fun, and um, you know, we came back and we're like, dude, we seen your guys' videos, and I was like, why don't we like, build a little team of our own? So then we got some UTVs, and then uh, we ended up buying uh, Polaris, and then we bought a, a Can-Am. Yeah. Her uncle's Matt Burroughs from Monster. Yeah. Right, right there. So we ended up getting one of his Can-Ams. Okay. And then it kind of just went from there. and then So it just, just kind of hopped in and just like, yeah. man, let, let's go. Yeah, and let's so then we just, uh, we went pretty ham in the UTVs. And I was like, I need more. Yeah. I need more. So we went and started getting into the bigger toys. So here we are with, with our friends from the Gravel Kings, and, and we're definitely stoked to be on this journey with them. Without further ado, I'm gonna shut my mouth up. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hop into this thing, guys. Let's get it going. So tell us about the jug, man. Uh, what what is your history and affiliation with it? Um so we prepped this truck with Jerry Laramore. When was that? Probably like 2000. 15 through 17, 18, I think is when he got the new truck. Okay. Um, so we worked on this thing for about uh, three seasons. Um, he raced a bunch of stuff, more snore, uh, some local stuff. It's been down to Mexico. Uh, Jerry had this truck. It had an H&M front kit on it. Okay. Jerry's, I mean, Jerry's known Kevin and Buff over at H&M forever. He had the H&M front end on it. He drove the truck around for a while. I think that's when it had the 347 stroker in it. So anyways, he sold it to a guy, I think it was a baseball player, something like that. The guy took and cut the entire front end off, did a center mount front end. Oh shoot. It wasn't very good. He ended up selling the truck back to Jerry. So Jerry didn't like the center mount front end that was on it. So he took and he cut the entire thing off and he welded his stock frame rails back on it so that he could put the H&M kit back on it. So tell us about those shock, tell us about some of those videos, man, that have, have kind of made this truck so famous on the interweb. There's, there's, uh, there's a lot of them to pick from. Probably the most uh, infamous one is the video of Jerry just wildly doing slap wheelies down Evan Hughes out in Plaster City. Should we go look at some modifications in the rear of this thing? Okay, yeah. One of the key modifications that really, really made this truck work, uh, I mean, it was, it, was, it was like a big ladder step. You see this tube here? Yeah. Okay, see how this thing kind of points right here to this tube junction? Yes, sir. Well, that used to be there, okay? So this bump stop used to be about four inches lower than it is currently. So what that means is the suspension would bottom out four inches sooner. The problem with that is there, there's a ratio. I mean, I don't know if it's really a ratio you need to stick to. It's kind of on a individual basis for the trucks. But normally a good rule of thumb is where this, where this plastic pad is on the bump stop here to the housing, you want at least 10 inches. I would say 10 is like the minimum. I would much rather have 12 or more. Okay, right? um, it's, 10 bare minimum. It's pretty difficult to get too much up travel because like your links are going to start crashing into everything. Like a lot of people worry about the ground clearance and everything. Of, of the, of of the, the tank and everything, and everything, the whole rear layout. That's why I say it's kind of on a case by case basis, but with a 40 inch tire, it's really hard to get this thing to have too much up travel. That was one of the modifications. The other thing is that it had a single spare tire right on top of the fuel cell. Okay. This is this is Gen 2 tire carriers, okay? Okay. Gen 1, Jerry built it all. So we added a tube here with a little, you know, stand here to hold the tire in place. Got it. Versus the other one, 
the strap had to go all the way around, and mm. the problem was when it hit the ground, the, strap, the strap got cut, the tires got ejected, and ah. yeah, it worked out because it was a cool video and everybody loves it. Man, thank you so much for, for, for that insight on this. I think the best thing for us to do is, is to go over this truck as we normally would with, as a built to destroy. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll hop to the front of this thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's see, man. So, so here we are with the jug. Tell us front to back. Up front here, the suspension on the front is from H&M. Okay. Sure they call this the, the Class 8 race kit. Okay. Um, so it's got the bigger, these are the COM24 bearings on there. It's, um, it's slightly different geometry. It's got a wider upper arm to fit the big shocks. Okay. Is it, so this isn't standard from H&M, the um, upper arm? It's a little slightly this modified? Is not, this is not like the standard H&M kit. This is, they call this the Class 8 race kit. Okay. So that's the biggest difference is that the upper arm is wider so that we can fit this King 4.0 shock in there. Which that bad boy. That's the, the the whole magic of this front end is having that gigantic shock right there. Okay. The ability to cram that thing in there, that's crucial. That's our suspension here. We've got our what, what size are these guys and all that good stuff? Um so this is a 2.5 coilover. Okay. And a 4.0 bypass. They're 12 inch stroke. Okay. Out here, these are some old school desert specialties hubs. These are sick, dude. It's got the standard issue uh JMR brakes in there. Um, that's another good story was actually like putting the brakes on this truck with uh, Donnie from Jmar. We learned a ton about braking and just setting everything up from Donnie. Yeah, definitely got to got to shout out Donnie from Jmar. If we look at this caliper, like dude, look at this thing. It's massive. Oh, know, like this dude. is a massive caliper. But it's one of those things it's like it's just like a heavy truck. You have to have a huge mass to be able to counteract the forces that are being applied to it. Right. Okay? The other big thing about this is that well it has, a, it has an actual bolted in bridge that adds rigidity to this entire open area of the caliper. And the biggest thing is that it has three bolts here. And if you notice, these are 7 16 diameter bolts and there's three of them. Big boys. Okay, so the way Donnie explained it was, look, there's a piston here and there's a piston here and there's a piston here. Okay, okay. if you take a line and draw it through the center line of that, yeah, notice there's bolts that are underneath the uh where the piston's actually even like the outside of the piston okay yeah. now if you look at a willwood caliper or even like the older cncs i don't know if it was an effort to keep them more compact but basically they don't have this third bolt they have maybe this bolt here on the willwoods it's even further up mm. so if you look at this if you basically drew a line through your uh through your pistons that's where you're applying the force and that's where you're trying to spread the caliper from so just from a geometrical standpoint if you only have a bolt securing it here in the middle of that, you still have piston past that. So it's gonna yeah. have leverage to push that apart. Damn. So this bolt here is, I mean, that's that's the key ingredient there is this third bolt, right? Cause you can see if you drew a line from this bolt to this bolt, it's past the pistons, right? It's so awesome that that um, Donnie and Jamar, you know, his team over there were able to engineer something that is, Stopping a freaking six thousand pound oh these yeah, rocket, these are, they're, dude. You know, uh, eight hundred horsepower so type of beast. Another another thing to check is if you actually took a set of calipers and you measured from outside to outside on the caliper. And if you take your willwood, we we did this. We actually took calipers and we measured the willwoods. Okay, we would get about thirty to thirty five thousandths of an inch of flex. On these, uh, we were getting about it was like three to four thousandths. So three to four four thousandths is the thickness of a human hair. Okay, so with 1800 PSI applied to this caliper, it's only flexing a human hair. All right, Roy, tell, tell us about the motor in this thing. Well, I mean, one thing you'll see on this is that it has a dry sump oiling system. Okay. Okay. Normally on an engine, there's an oil pump that's usually, well, on an LS, it's driven off of the front of the crankshaft, right? On like a small block Chevy, it's driven off the back, off, there's a gear off of the um, uh, camshaft that runs the oil pump. But normally the oil pump is inside the motor and it's got a pickup that goes down into your oil pan and it picks up oil from your oil pan to distribute around the motor. Okay. An issue with a wet sump type setup is that when you're bouncing around, you know, I mean, say you're leaned over, you know, cornering hard or yeah. anything where there's some G-forces pulling oil away from the sump of the uh, oil pan. Yeah there's a possibility that you could starve the pump, which is going to starve your bearings, which is going to destroy your motor. Oh, wow, okay. So, the solution for that, for a lot of motors, is a dry sump system. So, you can see it's got an external oil pump. That oil pump there, it's driven off the front of the crankshaft with a belt, so it's basically just a big, high-pressure oil pump 
that uh, is separate from the rest of everything. Okay. Okay. So the advantage with that is that you can adjust the pressure and the flow. Imagine, okay, so imagine you have your crankshaft in your motor. Okay, you're doing 6,000 RPM, the thing's spinning 6,000 RPM. Your oil pan is full of oil, right? So the, the parts of the crankshaft are going to be whipping through that oil and it's going to create resistance. So any resistance to the motor spinning freely is costing you, I mean, it's costing you horsepower. Right. Dry sump system will typically free up, I mean, usually about 10-ish percent horsepower. Uh, the other thing is when you draw a vacuum on the crankcase, it's actually sucking your piston rings into the cylinder, okay? So it promotes a better seal on your piston rings to your cylinder, um, which decreases blow-by, which increases horsepower. So on all levels, the dry sump is definitely a winner for lubrication systems. The, the patent motor, what, what kind of power is in this thing right now from what you remember last? <laughs> so this motor actually has, um, I forget the designation, but they're, it's, um, that's a NASCAR style cylinder head on it. They move the ports, they move the valves, it's all different geometry on the top end. Mm -hmm. With these heads on this motor, last time we downed it, it was 499 horsepower to the tires. And that nice. was on 40 inch tires. Okay. It's a pump gas Herbst trophy truck motor. Baja Designs up here? All Baja Designs lights. Hi uh, Brennan. The guy, the guy that wired this and did all the electronic stuff is actually Brennan Scully from Baja Designs. Oh, Brennan wired this? Yeah, Brennan wired this whole truck. Uh, hey, Brennan, I didn't know you did that. That's Brandon, awesome, man. That Hell yeah. The, <laughs> that was awesome. one of the nicer, that was a really good upgrade on this thing too. So, uh, here you can see, this is the AEM, uh, what is this? I think this is a CD7 digital dash. They sell this dash, it's just kind of a standalone dash unit, and you can put what they call a, um, I forget what AEM calls it, but it's basically like a CAN bus network device where you have inputs that go into the CAN bus network device, and that communicates with this dash to display literally any parameter that you could imagine on there. Damn. Um, we could have sensors for brake pressure, shock temperature, transmission slip, pressures in or out. I mean, literally any, anything, anything that you want to display on this is possible. You just have to have the right sensors and you have to wire it into the CAN bus unit. It's got the Switch Pros here, which those are great, great units. They're super rugged, easy to set up. Nice, And man. they're actually really awesome because they have uh, separate inputs and outputs. So you can have this Switch Pros unit communicate with the dash with, I mean, if this thing had EFI, we could, we could set up all sorts of stuff so that everything was on automatic control. It's got two Parker pumpers in there. Yes, it's got, uh, I mean, I don't know. This is definitely a race setup. I don't know if I'd run your transmission dipstick inside on a pre-runner. It's probably not a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, but on a race truck, it's pretty nice having that there because, you know, you can check your fluid right there. Let's go over the rear of this thing, man. Fire suppression system. Definitely got to get one in here, right? You really don't understand the importance of having a fire suppression system until you You're been on fire. On fire. One thing that always really, really surprised me is like for more the minimum requirement for a fire extinguisher is a two and a half pound extinguisher, which is, that's, that's the little guy, okay? Mm. And okay, so just imagine, there's 70 gallons of gasoline. You ever seen 70 gallons of gasoline lit on fire? Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, have you ever seen three gallons of ATF uh, at 300 plus degrees and 100 PSI spraying all over your exhaust catch oh on fire? Oh my God. It's, it's, it's probably five or 600 bucks for a fire suppression system, but how much are you gonna spend rebuilding this thing when it burns to the ground? True. Minimum, minimum four fire extinguishers or a decent suppression system. Well, take us through the back of this thing, man. Uh, real quick, we got, okay. we got some Magnaflows back here. We got, we got Magnaflows. Um, nice little sway bar. That, yeah, so that's, uh, that was always one of the things I kind of wanted to change on this truck was the sway bar setup. With the shocks on here, you can see it better, but you can see how this is kind of ground down. Okay. When yeah. we put the four fives on there, the four fives is a significantly larger shock. Right, right. So there are some clearance issues. Same desert specialties hubs in the back. Same nice. JMR calipers. Um, Did you do the gearing in this thing? Uh, yeah, I set up the third member of this thing. It's right now. It's got a 543 gear ratio set up. Okay. Um, that's all the gear works uh, slash strange parts in it. Okay. It's a 36 line jumbo 30 setup. Big boy trophy truck stuff. It's the trophy truck 36 line setup. Jumbo, yeah. Um, that's a four inch tube works trophy truck housing. Oh, that's the one, man. That it's, damn tube works there. This is, you know, yeah. The, the goal of this truck was to build it with all trophy truck parts. There it is, um, guys. There's the damn rear end. 
Beautiful. And then all the fan, all the coolants back here. All the we all got the a ton of coolers. There's a big radiator. The, the rule is on these things: you put the biggest radiator you can fit, and you put the biggest fuel cell you can fit. Right. What is it? It's all CBR. Um, cool. Radiator. Mm -hmm. Standard issue training coolers. That was. I mean, that's another thing. Uh, refinements on this truck would be repackaging the transmission coolers back there, because you can see those three are kind of crammed in. There's not not great um, airflow going back there. Okay. The space is kind of limited just because of the way the chassis is set up. Simple but works. Standard issue stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's a spare alternator there. We have two batteries, all the fuel filters, etc. over down there. Yes, sir. Uh, one cool thing is, uh, so that tank right there with the, I guess it's faded pink cap now. Okay. Uh, but that tank is actually the transmission filler. So I don't know if you guys have ever tried to fill a tr uh, transmission through the dipstick, but the dipstick <laughs> hole is about that big, yeah. and it sucks filling them up. It takes forever. Oh my so, god! So what we do is Colhane actually makes a um, they make a piece that bolts on to the governor cover of the transmission, and it's got a dash 16 fitting on it. So we run a dash 16 hose, which a dash 16 is a one inch diameter hose. So we run that back to that tank right there, and you can see the big dash 16 coming off of the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's what fills the transmission fluid back into the tank. And those two fittings that come out of the side of that tank right there are actually the vent coming from the transmission and the vent going out to the back of the truck. Ah. So what I do is you take the transmission vent that comes out of the case of the transmission itself, run that to that bottom fitting. So if the transmission ever does vent fluid, what happens is it fills up that tank and it yep. circulates back into the train. Nice. So that way you don't, if the transmission vents, you don't lose any transmission fluid. Unless if it was venting so much that it filled that thing all the way to the top and then it would blow transmission fluid out that top. <laughs> right, thing, right. Out to the back of the truck, which right. that would have to be an insane amount of venting right, going right. on, which means you got other problems. Something else probably, is going on. You should yeah. probably address whatever's going on. Well, man, this is this is incredible. There, there's a lot of stuff going on with this truck. We're we're super happy to help document this. Really great to see you guys working with the Gravel Kings on this thing. Well, guys, hope you guys liked all those awesome stories um, and all that useful information. So many cool things coming up with Gravel Kings and yeah. Roy and, and Terra Crew. We got a lot of stuff planned. Thank you guys for coming on this journey with us. You guys are going to learn a lot more about this truck with Roy in the future. We're actually going to be, uh, Roy's pulling the shocks like we mentioned right now, and we're going to be testing this thing in Barstow real soon. So I can't wait to share that with you guys. Ronnie is going to get some tips from the man himself right here on how to whip this thing. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited, guys. Yeah. I'm pretty stoked. You, you guys ready to do this? I'm ready, or what? dude. Hell ready. yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys have any questions for, for Gravel Kings, for Roy, for us, post it down in the comments. We'll do our best to kind of get back to you guys. Um, definitely be sure to like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. So it helps us uh, to create content. That's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Later. Yeah. <laughs>